Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Master, <laughs> your stories are ready. Ooh, goody. <laughs> The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I'll be talking with author Ellie Douglas. Ellie Douglas was born and raised in New Zealand. Her addiction to horror is paramount, and she loves everything about it. Along with that, she loves building the characters and bringing them to life through their backstories. She is the author of three award-winning books. Today, we will talk about who has inspired her as an author what inspired Hounded, she gives us an insight on her upcoming works and offers her take on how to approach the editing process. So without any further ado, let's begin. Hounded by Ellie Douglas Chapter 1 The First Taste David took a deep breath to fill his emphysema disease lungs and opened his front door. How he loved the summer. Moving to Sleepy Hollow, New York 12 years ago to retire was the best decision in his 76 years. He had to cover his eyes because the sun that just an hour ago was orange and pink was now a yellow inferno. He looked at the overgrown weeds robbing most of the cobble pathway leading to the garage, remembering he had been promising his wife he would take care of that job weeks ago. He knew what he would have to do after lunch that day, and sighed. Getting on his knees with arthritis wasn't easy. It was worse on his back. All that bending would surely cripple him, he thought. He stood listening to the birds rejoicing in melodious song. The beautiful way they called to one another, the songs coming from different trees along the avenue of their cul-de-sac. It brought a smile to his face, and he stood a little longer than usual that morning listening to the musical of nature and surround sound, every shade in summer in full bloom a kaleidoscope for the soul. Looking over his shoulder, he watched his wife Janet tending to her rose garden before disappearing into the backyard and closing the wooden fence behind her. David smiled with the warm glow of happiness, knowing that Janet would be tending to her precious gnomes in an effort to distract herself from pining over their missing dog Sasha, an American water spaniel, chocolate brown, with one white paw. She had been gone for just four days, enough to send Janet into a downward spiral. Grabbing at his chest, he took another big breath as he stepped inside his garage to finish building a gift for Janet, a wind chime made up completely of scrap metal he had been painstakingly twisting, reshaping, and turning it all into her favorite animal, the horse. With the electric angle grinder on, he could barely hear his own breathing, let alone what he dismissed as a horrific scream. As he carried on reshaping a piece of metal, the screaming he thought he heard came again more frequently more powerful, and loud enough to be heard over the grinder. He staggered in terror and rammed the angle grinder forward too quickly, causing a piece of metal to explode in all directions in bright orange and gold colors before dying out. He grabbed his chest and squeezed it tightly with wide eyes. His heart skipped several beats and panic rose deep inside as he imagined having a heart attack. Then like a lighthouse foghorn, Another hell-raising shriek erected him to full alert and he timorously dropped the angle grinder to the ground. He tugged roughly at his protective goggles with clammy nervous fingers and feverishly removed them. Despite the ambient summer morning temperature, his skin turned icy cold and goose pimples laminated his fragile aging body. The cord to his grinder snagged at his heels like hissing snakes as he made his way out of the garage still clutching his chest as another whale had got him moving. Adrenaline flooded his body as if he was on an intravenous drip, right into the blood at full pelt. To him it felt like an endless run to the backyard. His heart thumped so hard it hurt, and his huffing, puffing, and wheezing from his tired lungs made it difficult to fill with air. He almost passed out from lack of oxygen. 
He felt his lungs deflating as his ribs tightened. His body seemed weighted down as though he were dragging a car with him. He paused briefly, panting, his hands resting on his knees as he bent forward and tried to catch his breath. Shrilling screams for help got him moving again. At 76 years old, he regretted ever having smoked. David was unable to see over the six-foot fence as more blood-curdling shouts rattled his nerves. Finally, he reached the brown wooden fence. He almost doubled over while heaving for air. With vibrating fingers, he fiddled with the latch until it came unlocked. Using his foot to push the gate open, he staggered into the backyard like a drunk. Dave's eyes widened as he witnessed the brutal butchering of his wife in 52 years. Dave suddenly felt ill and looked disbelieving at his beloved pet that was almost unrecognizable. Twelve years ago, his wife Janet had saved Sasha from termination. The rescue dog had really rescued Janet with the bond they formed during early morning walks, teaching Sasha to fetch her slippers and cuddling on the couch during winter. A family dog that was as much of a child as it could ever have been. He watched his wife bounce back from the brink of death from severe depression and knew he had done the right thing by introducing Sasha back then. Side by side, the two were inseparable. Now he regretted it through gritted teeth as he bitterly slammed the dog in a desperate attempt to free it from his loving wife. Sasha bit at Dave, and then the dog returned her attention to a bloodied and distraught Janet. Dave got closer and saw Janet's right arm had been half torn away from her body just above the elbow. It was only hanging by a few threads of taut skin. Her gray, short hair soaked with blood clung to her cheeks and her pale blue eyes pleaded for him to help. He needed to vomit, but adrenaline kept the bile down as he flew into action. Grabbing Sasha's tail, he pulled hard, screeching at the dog to stop. Sasha returned the tail, pulling with a gripping bite so violent that it went through several layers of skin and forced Dave to his knees in agonizing pain. Unable to remove the clamp that Sasha had on his hand like a vice of steel, the more he pulled back, the harder Sasha bit down. His eyes welled up with tears from the burning of skin being ripped from the frail aged hand. Finding strength, he lifted his left hand and brought it down hard on the dog's nose, only angering her more. Suddenly, Sasha's head shook violently side to side, dragging David's body with her vicious movements. His whole body was forced side to side, as if he was riding an out-of-control coal cart being tossed sideways repeatedly. Winching in pain, he raised his left arm again and punched the dog in the face with great force. This time, Sasha let go. Dave instinctively retracted his torn hand to his chest. The pain was nothing he had ever felt before. Bright scarlet blood soaked his blue shirt and darkened it. Unwilling to look at his mangled hand, he gazed around the lawn for a weapon. Getting onto his feet, he took two steps towards Janet, unable to reach her as Sasha jumped up and pushed him to the ground. She got on his back, biting his neck and head repeatedly until he passed out from too much pain. When he stopped squirming, Sasha went back and finished feasting on the screaming Janet. Get off! Get off! Janet's yells turned to low moans. Help me! Help me! As the zombie dog struck again with its sharp teeth, it sliced through Janet's skull, degloving her head and exposing her brain. Janet's eyes filled with a dark cloud. Blood oozed from her nose into her torn mouth. Her body jolted as she passed away and freed herself from the bloodthirsty attack. Janet's right arm twitched as if to say goodbye. Dave, in shock, thought he was hallucinating as he began to regain consciousness, thinking he was watching something heinous on the TV. Forcing his eyes open, he took in the reality happening right in front of him. His stomach retched as he blinked repeatedly at the dog annihilating his wife. Dave's body gave no warning as it suddenly expelled vomit like a missile, landing two feet from the cat who had wandered outside. Its fur spiked up in aggression and he began hissing as his eyes fully dilated. Tobias smelled the vomit, sniffed Janet's remains, licked a severed finger and then approached the crazed dog with a loud crying meow. His ears lay flat as he arched his back and bared his teeth. Sasha's intent was on David as she made a horrific, deep-throated sound and shuffled closer. Tobias prowled around the dog, doing as much as he could to gain her attention. The zombie dog had its eyes set on finishing off David. Her paws sank into the blood-soaked lawn, splashing muck up her legs as she made her way to a terror-stricken David. 
Sasha sank her razor-sharp teeth along his shoulder, then shook the 130-pound old man like a rag doll as it gouged at his torso with its deformed, decaying claws. Sasha went straight for David's head, chomping down on his skull with an audible crack, and lifted him two feet into the air, then brutally shook him around before she dropped him like a discarded bag of trash. Dave, crippled of any rational thoughts, had everything rushed at him all at once. The day he met Janet, he instantly fell in love with her. The decision was not to have children. The traveling they did together, Greece, Italy, Rome. Oh, how they loved Rome. Their fondness for Paris and taste of frog's legs. Everything sped past him as vertigo threatened to hold him hostage on the ground. David had now started exhaling without inhaling. His lungs burned. His upper eyelids pushed up high as his mouth stretched wide, spilling saliva and gasping for air. Dave thought he was dying. They say you see your past before you die, but he never believed it until this very day. Slideshows flooded his brain, causing a speeding memory vortex to slam him with visions he had almost forgotten. Even the arguments followed with makeup sex, getting Sasha and seeing how it pulled Janet out of her depression. Finding Tobias dumped on the freeway one morning after pulling a night shift as a security guard at the docks. How the water smelled whenever big cargo ships left and sneaking off with work buddies for a can of beer. Movies he and Janet watched often during those retirement years and Sunday roasts that over time turned into TV dinners. His mind was riddled with memories, flashing like a slideshow on steroids. Dave pushed the pause on his memory show, not wanting to give up, gulping at air to fill his lungs, he screamed at the dog, Stop, Sasha, stop! Sasha picked him up by his head again and swung his body around, knocking over Janet's prized gnomes and viciously dropping him hard onto the manicured lawn. With outstretched arms, he tried to grab a broken bit of the gnome. Each time he grew close, the dog dragged him back. Dave clawed at the earth as he howled in agony. He dug his nails into the soft dirt now dampened by the blood as he pulled up grass in a feeble attempt to get away as the dog bit down on his lower back. Dave let out a shrill scream as Sasha ripped off flesh in a single fluid motion and peeled it from Dave's back like a child ripping newspaper. Using his good arm, he reached forward again and again as he feverishly tried to grab something to use to fight back. Dave's painful howls exhausted his lungs of air and he passed out again. Regaining consciousness, Dave's eyes widened as he finally saw what remained of his wife. The worst part, the part that would keep him awake and yelling her name, was her eye plastered to her cheek in crusted, coagulated blood. Painfully lifting his head up, he saw parts of Janet's body littering the back lawn, sticking out of the ground like twisted, creeping plants. Her waxy, slaughtered remains were still moist with fresh blood that had run like a thick red gravy across the manicured lawn. The desire to die saturated him. The longing to join his beloved wife grew stronger with every labored breath. His body was shutting down from the emotional and physical pain, willingly. Barely alive, he was bleeding out, losing the fight to stay awake. All right, and we are back from that extremely horrific excerpt, and I am here with author Ellie Douglas. And um, Ellie, how are you doing today? I'm really good. Thank you. How about yourself? I'm, well, at this point, I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> that was a great excerpt. Um, it, it was a great story, um, and I can't wait to read the rest. Um, just because the prologue instantaneously captures you. And um, those people who are out there listening, it's very good. So we do appreciate what you've brought to the show today. Um, now, my question, my biggest question, is what inspired Hounded? I wanted to be different. There's so many zombie genres out there that hadn't touched animals. And I thought, well, why not do it with a dog? Yeah, yeah, I like that. Because, you know, dogs, and I don't want to say this because I'm, I'm a major pet lover. I'm a major dog and cat lover. But dogs can be terrifying when they're, you know, angry. or Normal, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, you just brought two things together and it, it merged perfectly. So I do appreciate it. And, and you do have other books out there. I mean, this isn't the only one. You have the sequel to Hounded, which is Hounded 2. But what other books do you have out there right now? Gosh, um, I, I deal with all horror books, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got an anthology out there that a lot of people have been 
saying it's pretty awesome. Again, it's all about zombies. Mm -hmm. Just just very, very different. Yeah, man, I tell you, in the zombie world, you have quite a bit that you can go on because just about anything and anybody can be a zombie. So, So when you're putting together a zombie story, I mean, a lot of people, they want to go ahead and they want to have just the gore and the horror and the blood and guts and everything. Um, when you put together a zombie story, what type of backstories do you kind of work with in order to keep a, a narrative going? I focus a lot on the characters and their backstories and how they survive or and sometimes how they don't survive. <laughs> <laughs> it really does depend. But for the anthology one, I've come up with different variations of how an actual zombie became a zombie for example the first story is from outer space so it's a rock that mm. actually is from an it's an alien basically so like a parasite very different. yeah oh cool exactly yeah so and you know i'm still kind of chilled by by the excerpt that we just read <laughs> okay and um <laughs> i have a question for you now how in the world does a sweet woman and those people who are seeing her image right now you look at this woman, and you see her on the street. There is no way that she is a horror writer. How in the world does a sweet woman like you become such a good horror writer? From years and years of watching horror and reading horror, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. There's just no real reason, no rhyme or reason. It's just I love my gore. I'm, I have to admit, I do like my horror. <laughs> yeah. and and there, Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to something like that, I mean, as, as well as you wrote this and just the excerpt alone from those who were listening, and I would encourage everybody out there to check out Hounded and Hounded 2 along with the other books that you have. Um, what other books do you have? Okay. I have, I have a story called The Dead Undone, and that's set in an asylum here in New Zealand, actually. And it's... The protagonist is going to be, or is, because I've already written it, <laughs> is a woman called Willa. And it's about her survival and her protecting the team of survivors. I wanted to do it from that angle. So there's that. There's, of course, the anthology. There is also another book, again, set in New Zealand, about a very crazy doctor. Hmm. Who, <laughs> who <laughs> without giving the story away too much, he his IQ developed from his very psychopathic parents who made him a very smart person, but they also did damage on him. So he wants to see people die through the fears that they have. It might be fear of spiders or rats or uh, claustrophobia or something like that. Mm. So there's that. Yeah. I like that. that. Kind of thing. Yeah. So, mm. and, and so then with these books that you've written, have you received any awards for these? I have. Yes, I have. Um, for Hounded, I have received the new Apple Award and just recently Top Shelf magazine and also Reader's Choice. Wow. Excellent job, by the mm. way. Congratulations. Now, Thank you. Now, with all the books that you've got already in place, do you have any new and upcoming works that you have that you're working on? I do. I'm working on another anthology, and this time it's going to be zombie-free. But oh. it's also a horror. It's yeah, um, it is definitely a horror, but without zombies. Just might be creatures. It could be someone else doing something. I won't reveal too much at this stage. Hmm. And the working of it. Well, we'll definitely mm. be uh, keeping our eyes out here at the Emma Blackwell show for something like that. So let me know when you're done with that one. All right. Oh, I will do. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And, and one of the bigger questions we have here on the Emmett Blackwell show because we want to find out. Where, at what point does an average person like you decide, I am now going to become a writer? Okay. Who inspired you to be a writer? That's such an easy answer. <laughs> Stephen King. No. Yeah. No. I just. I, <laughs> Do you, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I am blown away. I. <laughs> he is really a good author. And, you know, if you're out there, Stephen King, um, I want to let you know that you have now corrupted this poor woman's mind, and she is now one of the greater horror writers out there. So, 
And uh, if you want to be on the show, go ahead and be on the show. Uh, anyhow, um, so what part of Stephen King's writing has inspired you? I would have to say all of it. It's it's so different. It's, even though he, he's focused, of course, on the horror, just the way that he wrote, the style of writing, mm-hmm. it, re- it really just it sits so on the edge or causes you to be on the edge because you don't know what's going to happen, and it can be quite terrifying. Yeah, and and just like, you know, when you're putting your stories together, you have all the gore, and like you said before, Mm -hmm. you have the character stories, and that is one thing that Stephen King is a master of, and, you know, a lot of authors should just take that to heart, you know, it's the characters that really drive a story. You could have any monster, you could have Mm -hmm. a spaceship, you could have a zombie, you could have a lizard that's, you know, two stories tall, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter Mm -hmm about all that unless you have the base of the character story what's really going on in these characters lives because i'm sure ellie you've seen movies and you've read books where the monster is the main focus and the characters are kind of like just side actors and Correct. you lose it you know it, it becomes a b movie you know mm-hmm. and it's sad but in you know and there's all there's a whole another culture out there that does appreciate that for what it is and i'm one of them but you know when you're reading a book you want that character connection and that's really what you're doing is you're creating a connection with your reader that says, you know, you could have been one of these people that just got bit by a zombie, you know? <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it really ties it in. But um, now when it comes to being a new author, you, you've been doing this for how many years now? Not that long. A few years. Okay. So, it's, it, yeah. And you've got your, your books out, which is great. You've got a small anthology and you're you're working on more. And yes. there's always a new author. Every day somebody's coming and, you know, that spark, that idea gets lit up in their brain. And they want to start that same path that you did. What is something that you would advise a new author? To do plenty of research. That's number one. Number two, go with their gut. Write everything down. You don't have to plot it. You don't have to do anything standardized by what is being told. Just go for it. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. Get your passion out there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause and all, then the only, sorry, carry yeah, on. Yeah. Cause all this stuff is happening in your own mind. So you can't get yeah. it wrong, especially fiction. Exactly. Just go. And then when you've done that, my other suggestion is very, very important. Make sure you have a very good editor. Mm-hmm. And that's another question <laughs> I have. So, yeah. so when you were looking around for editor, did you look like on the web? Did you, do you have friends that you know that can look this stuff over for you? Both. Oh, that's good. And it good. took me a long time, <laughs> a very long time to find the editor that I now have, and she's brilliant. Yeah, and that's something, too, I want to let everybody else out there know. Just one editor, just like any type of film critic, any type of book reviewer, okay? One book reviewer or film critic or editor or anything like that, they're going to give you their take on what you're doing. So get multiple editors. Get people to look at your story. It doesn't matter if this is Grandma uh, Sue and she wants to read your story. You know, Let her read it and tell you truthfully what it is. Now, I'm not saying go ahead and get all your friends together that, you know, don't want to upset mm. you. You know, get your get your friends that are critical of what you do sometimes and get them to, yes. to listen to this story because they're going to be the ones who are going to tell you the truth. The, the good friends are. So, yes. And, um, Ellie, and you need you, yeah, you need that criticism. You need that critic. You have to. Oh, yeah, because you're going to face higher and, and stronger critics out there in the world once you release your book. And it's better to take care of it before it gets to that point. That's so, right. Yeah, and and I would like to thank you so much, Ellie, for being here on the show. I was ever since I read your your um your book hounded. I I've wanted to have you on the show because it was so good. I mean, I could just imagine all the crunching and the the biting and the gnawing. Um, so it's it's a great story, and uh, I encourage everybody out there to at least get started with hounded. If you want to get captured on page one, do it because that's where I mm. got that's where I got uh, captured. So Ellie, thank you so much for being here on the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. No problem. And I want to remind everybody else out there to like, share, subscribe, uh, do all the clicky stuff that you need to do on the (laughs) Internet in order to get involved with the Emmett Blackwell Show. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing off. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors.
Master, your story is already. Ooh, goody. <laughs> The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality.